All right, we'll get started. Miigwech and merci beaucoup, and thank you for joining us today for our Health Time, Health Science, our Lunchtime Health Sciences webinar on We Have Pelvic Floor Pelvic Health Physiotherapy, delivered by Ashley Ross, physiotherapist. I'm Jennifer DeBaker, and I'm the Program and Partnership Coordinator here for the Health Sciences at Nelson University. Before I get started, I'll do some welcome and introductions. Reminder about your microphone being off for the duration of the webinar. The webinar is being recorded and will be posted to our YouTube channel at a later date. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, please feel free to put them into the chat. I will monitor it. And we will also have a dedicated question and answer period throughout today's presentation. All of our previous webinars are now on YouTube and can be found on our RS and NOTIPS website under the resource section or you can find them directly on the Nossum U TV channel on YouTube. We want to start by acknowledging the land which Nossum U is located, to raise awareness of Indigenous presence and land rights, and to acknowledge the colonial history and current history in Ontario and Canada as a whole. Nossum University respectfully acknowledges that the entirety of the school's wider campus of Northern Ontario on the homelands of the First Nations and Métis peoples. The medical school buildings at Laurentian University and Lakehead University are located on the territory of the Anishinaabeg Nation, specifically Atikamishing and Wanapitea First Nations and, First, and Fort William First Nations. We humbly ask, wherever you're calling in from today, that you think about the land and areas where you reside. Our speaker today is Ashley Ross, physiotherapist. Ashley holds a Bachelor of Science degree with honors in human kinetics from Laurentian University and a Master's of Science in Physiotherapy from Queen's University. Ashley is in good standing with the College of Physiotherapists of Ontario and is registered to perform acupuncture and internal pelvic exams. She's a member of the Women's Health Division of the Canadian Physiotherapy Association and Ontario Physiotherapy Association. Ashley strives to create a specific and individualized treatment plan for her clients. Over the last couple of years, Ashley has gained an interest in pelvic health, treating women and men who suffer from bowel and bladder incontinence and pelvic pain. Ashley's goal is to educate women to talk about issues that they would normally feel too embarrassed to discuss through education, exercise, and empowerment. Ashley wants to change the belief that women just need to live with their pelvic floor issues because they've had a baby or are getting older. In many cases, these are dysfunctions in their pelvic floor, and with treatment, their symptoms can greatly improve or resolve. Merci beaucoup and miigwech and thank you. Ashley, thank you for your time today. We truly appreciate you sharing your knowledge and very much looking forward to your talk and ask questions. So now I will turn things over to you. Uh, great, thank you, Jen. That was great. Um, so I'm just gonna share. Uh, so I go to share content. No. Share. There's a little box with the arrow again at the bottom. Oh yes. Okay, I was looking at the top, and then share screen. Again, I'll monitor the chat if anything pops up. If you have any issues, just let me know. Okay, perfect. Okay, so hi everyone. My name is Ashley Ross. Thanks, Jen, for that introduction. Um, I do want to kind of keep this as informal as we can. I have prepared a presentation, but I definitely welcome questions throughout the presentation. So if you do have any present um, questions, please just feel free to ask. If you want, you can save them for the end as well. Um, but sometimes we forget our questions, so you're uh, yeah more than welcome to ask throughout. Okay, so I know Jen explained me a little bit, but I'll just, um, yeah, have a little about me slide as well. So, um, yeah, I graduated from kinesiology at Laurentian, and then my husband and I ended up taking a year off. We traveled to Thailand, taught English there, and then we ended up climbing um, base camp on Mount Everest. So that was a fun year. Um, then I got accepted into physiotherapy at Queen's, so I have to cut my travel short and come back for that. And then started my practice um, while working for a clinic, um, primarily in outpatient MSK. 
um, mostly with sports injuries. I never thought I would go into pelvic health at all. I remember one of the um, owners asked, like, oh, do you want to go into pelvic health? It's starting to become a popular topic. And I thought there was no way that I would be doing that. Um, but then fast forward a couple of years, and I gave birth to my daughter. And I realized the gap in women's health postpartum. Um, it was crazy. I had all these appointments while I was pregnant. And then postpartum, I got one pap test and a couple screening questions for postpartum depression and was offered birth control. And that was really the end. No one cared to see how I was healing. No one even looked to see that my pelvic floor was okay. Um, I had, I would consider a pretty decent birth, um, but still was feeling symptoms um, and just thought, you know, this isn't normal. Um, spoke to my family doctor about it and they were like, yeah, you know, you had a baby, give it a couple more months, pretty dismissive. So nine months later, I was still experiencing um, some rectal pain. So I decided to um, go see a pelvic health therapist. And then after a couple of visits, my symptoms were resolved. And that's what kind of led me into um, going into this line of work. And at that time, there was only Celeste Buffard in Sudbury. And I thought, how can there only be one therapist doing this? Like, that's ridiculous. So, um, yeah, so on my mat leave, I started to explore pelvic health, did some continuing education courses in that. And then when I returned, I started to practice um, pelvic health and MSK. Um, and then after my son Ari was born, I ended up deciding to just really wanted to hone in on pelvic floor. So I decided to start my own practice and rent a space out of the chiropractic and wellness center in Sudbury. So now I have my own business that I would say is like 90% um, pelvic health clients. So that's kind of how I got to where I'm at now. Um, what I hope you'll get from this presentation is, um, sorry, I'm gonna just, there we go. Um, I hope you get an understanding of like misconceptions around pelvic health. Like I said, so much is just normalized and I really hope you start to um, gain more knowledge in that and not just tell people that's how it is. If you hear of any of these symptoms, I want you to kind of understand what the pelvic floor is and what its role. So I'll go over like some brief anatomy. Um, there's about five P's that we treat in pelvic floor. So we'll go over what those are. Um, and then I just want to talk to you about how to like screen patients with low back pain um, to determine if a pelvic floor referral may be warranted. So I'll go into a couple of studies, but they've definitely found that there's a strong link between um, um, low back pain and pelvic floor dysfunction. So if things aren't resolving, pelvic health may be something to consider. Um, and then a couple of tidbits on how you can start to support these clients that you suspect may have pelvic floor dysfunction. And I'll go over a couple of case studies to give you an example of some of the clients I work with and maybe some things that you can take with you to um, help future people you're working with. Okay. Oh. There. Um, so just so everybody's aware, um, pelvic floor, pelvic health, um, physiotherapy um, isn't a protected title. Um, you're actually not even supposed to say you're a pelvic health physiotherapist. You're supposed to say you're a registered physiotherapist. And then I just have the word pelvic health under my name. Um, so if people say they um, treat people with pelvic floor, pelvic health conditions, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're doing internal exams. And the gold standard to really be treating these clients is with an internal exam. So I just want to kind of let people know that there are a lot of people that say they do pelvic floor and pelvic health or treat um but that doesn't mean that they're doing internal exams. So um, be aware of that, especially if you do start to refer to other people. Because um, in order to perform internal exams, um, you need to be rostered with the College of Physiotherapists. Um, and so you're specifically rostered under the title um, that you're able to do pelvic internal exams, which includes putting an instrument hand or finger beyond the labia majora or beyond the anal bridge. Okay, so I definitely am rostered to do that. Um, so just, I guess, know who you're referring to, or if you go see somebody, know who you're seeing. So beliefs that are out there that people come into my office here, um, telling me all the time, um, when I talk to people like on the streets or wherever, um, definite common beliefs are that it's normal to leak after you have children, that it's normal to feel different after you have children, that things just are never going to be the same. Um, people believe that painful periods are meant to be painful. 
that as you age, it's normal to start leaking. By the end, you'll be in some kind of depends. That's just normal aging. Um, after menopause, sex is going to become painful. It becomes raw and dry. Um, and that's, again, how it is. I have people come in and they're told, you know, well, you're a woman. That's what happens to you. You've had a child. That's what happens. You're aging. That's what happens. There's nothing that can be done. And you just have to live with it. So this leaves these people feeling so defeated and um, really hopeless. And, um, you know, some people come in and they're just having like a little bit of leaking if they jump or something. So it's not overly affecting their quality of life. But a lot of some people I see, they're no longer socializing with friends because of these conditions. They're no longer being intimate with their partner because of these issues. Um, you know, they've totally withdrawn from society and their quality of life has just... Um, gone out the window. So to offer no hope to them is really sad. And um, I want to kind of normalize these things. And yet they are common. They happen to a lot of people, but they're not normal. And there is help and there is things that we can do. And I'm not saying that pelvic health is going to cure everyone, but it can definitely make a very big difference for a lot of people in reducing their symptoms, um, if not resolving them, and um, at least give them their quality of life back. Um, so if you take nothing else from this presentation, I ask that you just start to um, not accept these statements as normal, especially if you're experiencing any of that or if any of your clients are or family or friends and just start to spread awareness that, yeah, these are common, but they are not normal. There is usually some kind of pelvic floor dysfunction happening and, um, and just giving these people hope is like, just would be amazing because um, they just come in tears in my office. So... Um, so just to give you some stats in Canada, about one in four women, some research says one in three have urinary incontinence, and then one in nine men. So most of my presentation is going to be focused on women because that is the majority of people I see. I do see men. Men do have pelvic floors as well, um, but it's definitely more common with women, and there's been more research with women. So um, I do see men. They're a significant lower amount in my case. Um, so just for today's presentation, I just want to stick with um women for the most part. Okay, um, so even though only like one in three women have urinary incontinence, only um, one in 12 are actually talking to their healthcare provider about this. Okay, so um, because they find this is an embarrassing topic, it's a private matter, depending on how they were raised, this isn't something that you talk about. And then a lot of them, again, just think this is inevitable. It's part of aging, it's part of being a woman, it's part of having a baby. Okay, so again, common, but um, not normal, and there is help. There is some treatment for these things. Okay. Um, so functions of the pelvic floor. Um, so pretty much the pelvic floor is like this hammock um, that starts at the front of the pubic bone. So here you can kind of see, um, it starts at the front here, and then it slings all the way to the back to your coccyx, and then it fans out to your ischial tuberosity, and it kind of creates this um, a hammock of support for the pelvic, pelvic visceral viscera, um, so specifically the bladder, the uterus, and the rectum. In women, in men, it would just be the um, bladder and rectum primarily. It does support other organs, but that's the main ones. Um, they have a voluntary control of the sphincters, of the urinary sphincter and of the anal sphincter. They have a role in stability, so they'll have a major role in like lumbar pelvic stability, stability of the SI joint. Um, your pelvic floor is part of that. Um, they have a major sexual function. So your pelvic floor has to be able to um, relax and accommodate um, to be able to have any kind of arousal or to experience any kind of um, penetration. Um, your pelvic floor muscles really need to be relaxed. So if they're super tight, um, sexual activity is gonna be um, really difficult or painful or just non-existent. Um, same thing with the sphincter control. Like you have to be able to um, contract your muscles to not have incontinence happen. Like you don't wanna be leaking or um, having bowel movements randomly. So you do need them to be able to contract and hold that contraction. But in order to fully empty, you do need these muscles to be able to relax and open. So the sphincter of the, um, um, the urethra has to be able to open to like kind of unkink that hose and allow urine to flow out. Um, and then same thing with bowels when you're having a bowel movement, the anal sphincter um, and part of the deeper pelvic floor muscles have to relax to allow um, bowel movements to pass through the rectum. 
Okay. Um, and then there's also a sub pup, um, mechanism which helps with um, lymphatic drainage. I don't really work that much um, with that section with people that I work with personally. I know other uh, pelvic health physios will, but mine are primarily the first four. Okay. Um, so just some anatomy. This might re be review for most of you, but just to kind of get an understanding of um, what the pelvis is. There's the, um, so, uh, so this is the picture here of this model here. So at the top, we have our iliac crest. You have your SI joint where the, um, um, the sacrum and the ilium meet. Um, you have your ASIS, your anterior superior iliac spine. Then there's your AIIS, which is your anterior inferior iliac spine. Um, down here, there's a tubercle just before your pubic symphysis, which is right in the middle where the two pubic bones meet. Um, so you have your pubic tubercle, which is an attachment point for um, some of the abdominal muscles, and you also have like the inguinal um, ligaments run through there um, or attached there. Um, then you have your obturator foramen, um, which is right through there, there, and you have your um, the obturator nerve artery and vein that run through. Okay, so in the back end, um, again, you have your iliac crest at the top. We have our SI joint here. So your um, posterior superior iliac spine is here. Um, you have your ischial spine um, is right there. That's an attachment point for some major ligaments in the pelvis. Um, your ischial tuberosities are on either end. Um, and then some ligaments to note, you have your um, sacrospinous ligament, which runs from the sacrum to the ischial spine right there. And then you have your sacrotuberous ligament, which runs from the sacrum to the ischial tuberosities. Um, so these are important because the um, one, the pudendal nerve, which is um, the nerve that primarily supplies the pelvic floor, um, runs through these two ligaments, and then they also prevent um, tilting of the sacrum as well. Okay, so they're good ones to know they can be a source of some pain. Oh, and then there's um, the coccyx as well, which is a major attachment point for quite a few muscles and ligaments. So those two ligaments I talked about attach um, at the coccyx as well. Um, coccygeus and levator ani, which are part of the deeper pelvic floor muscles, attach at the coccyx. And then you also have your larger um, gluteus maximus has an attachment point at the coccyx. So a lot attaches there. Um, and a lot of people can experience um, pain at the coccyx. So it is something that we work with as well. Um, so likely the bony structures are a review for a lot of people, but I'm assuming most of you don't know about the anatomy of the pelvic floor. Um, I graduated about eight years and now eight years ago now. Um, and when I was in school, we had one lecture on the anatomy of the pelvic floor. And coming out of that, I could tell you I knew nothing about it. Um, so I'm hoping things have changed, but I don't think much has, to be honest. So um, if I'm wrong, let me know. Um, so this here is like the first layer of the pelvic floor. So it's more kind of external and, um, you don't need to go internal to access these muscles. Okay. So, um, right here you have your, um, bulbospongiosis in men and bulbocavernosis in women. It runs right along the, um, arch of the, um, the pubic arch. Then you have your um, ischiocavernosis, which runs on either side of the labia of that muscle. And men, this is obviously just closed. Um, and there's that. Then you have your superficial transverse um, perineal muscle. They run on either side and form in the middle um, at the perineal body. I didn't mark that down on here, but where those attach right here is called the perineal body. Um, it's pretty much the attachment point of a lot of the muscles in the middle. And then from the um, vagina to the anus is your perineum. So I also think it's important to note just kind of general anatomy. I don't have it written down too much, but um, of a woman here. So this is um, just to give you the best view. Um, you have your clitoris at the top. Then you have your urethra, which is what you pee out of. Then you have your vagina, um, a vaginal canal, and then your perineum and your anus. Okay, so when people say vagina, the vagina, really they're talking about your vulva. Um, so that's kind of, the vulva is everything external that you see that most people talk about. Um, the vagina is actually the internal opening, 
Okay, so just to clarify that for some people. Um, and then pretty much, so this first layer has primarily a sexual function. Um, so it helps with erection or um, yeah, erection of the clitoris and penis, rigidity of the penis, and it also helps to propel semen. So for ejaculation, um, and then there's also a bit of control over the sphincter of the urethra as well for women. Okay. Um, when we go into the deeper layer of the pelvic floor, so I say this is like the bowl of the pelvic floor, that hammock that I was kind of talking about, we have these muscles here. So this is a great draw, um, drawing by MJ Forget. Um, she's in North Bay, and so she drew this, and um, I find it just as a great example of um, what's happening at the pelvic floor. I found it was the best way for me to understand what's happening. Um, I'm not sure if I'm able to have like a pointer. Anyway. Um, Oh, here's a marker. Is it? Oh, here, laser pointer. Okay, so here's the pointer. So these are the different muscles. So um, a lot of people will call these muscles the levator ani, and they pretty much attach. So if you're looking, this is looking down, um, like a superior view of the pelvis. So this here is your pubic bone. Back here is your sacrum and coccyx. Um, then you have your like glams on the side. Okay, so here is your um, so this again is a female. So you have your urethra right there, your vaginal opening, and then this is your um, rec uh, your anal opening. Okay, and there's some muscles that sling right around. So these muscles together um, with iliococcygeus are called your levator ani. So you have so for um, you have your pubococcygeus muscle, which goes right around the whole system. You have your puborectalis muscle, which goes right around the anus, um, and that muscle is super important for um, for bowel movements. It has to be able to really relax because it kind of provides this like kink, um, and if it's not relaxed, it's going to be really hard to pass stool, and um, there'll be more straining involved. So the puborectalis is a, an important muscle for that. Um, and then women have an extra muscle, it's called your pubovaginalis, which runs around the vaginal opening. So men wouldn't have this, this would be closed, this muscle wouldn't exist, and it would just be your um, puborectalis. Okay, you also have your ischiococcygeus muscle, which goes from the ischial spine to the sacrum, your piriformis muscle, um, you can access internally through your pelvic floor, and then you have your obturator internus. So these muscles all really work as a unit together. Um, and they really help to support the pelvic viscera, like I talked about. They have some control over the sphincters. Um, they have a major stability, role in stability for the sacrum iliac joint and the uh, lumbar pelvic area. And then they obviously do lateral rotation of the hip, specifically like the obturator internus and the piriformis. Okay, so I didn't wanna get too complicated, but I did think it was important to show you um, the muscles Okay. Um, so then I also want to talk about like the deep core system. So a lot of people, when they're training people with low back pain, they'll talk about training your core. And, um, you know, and most people that consists of your transverse abdominis. But really your core is a whole canister system and it really contains your diaphragm up at the top underneath your ribs, your transverse abdominis, which is this like corset muscle that runs um, around your stomach, your multifidi at the back, and then your pelvic floor is at the bottom. So it's the base of this whole canister. And so really with breathing, with contraction, um, with core work, your pelvic floor should really be included in that whole system. Okay, so something to think about depending on type of clients you're seeing. Um, if this is work that you're training, um, just training TA um, may not be getting the whole system. So um, the five P's of pelvic health are um, pee, poo, penetration, pain, and whole person. So I'll... Um, and I got this from Jill Mueller. She's a physiotherapist uh, down south. Um, I saw this in one of her presentations. I thought it was a really perfect way to explain what we do. So we ask lots about peeing. Um, I'll always ask someone, like, do you have any incontinence, like any leaking with jumping, sneezing, coughing, laughing, anything like that? Um, when you get the urge to go to the bathroom, do you have to, like, run to the bathroom right away? Are you allowed to delay voiding? 
Um, I'll ask them when you sit on the toilet, are you able to start the stream right away? Um, or do you have to like wait a bit? Do you have to strain to start the stream of urine? Um, is it continuous? When you're done, do you feel done? So quite a few questions around just how you pee. Um, the next P is poo. So lots of questions about bowels. So people are often uncomfortable with this um, topic sometimes. Um, I'll say like, do you have any bowel issues? And they'll be like, no. And then I'll ask a little bit further and it's like, well, yeah, I do have constipation. I do strain. I only have a bowel movement every like four days. Um, I'll ask, do you feel empty? No, I don't feel empty. They get a sense of like bloating in their stomach when they're having a bowel movement. And I'll ask like, do you feel the urge to go to the bathroom? Um, are you able to control that? Do you have any fecal incontinence, any leaking of your bowels? Um, and to what extent? So those, I'll ask them how they're going to the bathroom, like what position they're in when they're going to the bathroom. Um, what does their stool look like? So, you know, is it like a soft form log? Is it bumpy? Is it little pebbles? Um, is it really loose? Um, what does it look like? Um, cause that can tell me a lot about how people are functioning as well. Um, I'll ask them about, um, intercourse. So penetration, again, this is a topic that people don't talk to a lot about. Um, so when I bring these up, people can be really hesitant. I've had quite a few women who like got referred to me from their doctor, but they didn't really understand what pelvic health was or what I was doing. And on my intake forms, I asked like a million questions. I think there's seven pages or something. <laughs> Excuse me, I just need some water. And um, um, I've had some people get pretty upset, like, why are you asking me these questions? My doctor doesn't even ask me these questions. Um, so it can be pretty intimate, especially when we get into this section. Um, so like, I'll ask, like, do you have pain with penetration? Do you have pain with thrusting? Do you have pain in just different positions? Are you avoiding certain positions because of pain? Are you you know, um, avoiding sex because it's painful. Um, after you're done, do you have pain with that? Um, so really kind of diving in, I'll ask if they'll use lubricant, if they use like vaginal moisturizers, different things. So again, like super personal, not questions that like many people have talked to a lot of people about. So um, yeah, some people can get really uncomfortable. So the biggest thing is to just um, normalize how you're talking. So not to talk in a quieter voice, um, just to talk about how you would talk about someone's knee, like really normalizing everything you're saying. Um, so that can make that person feel a little bit more comfortable. I'll also, also talk about pain, ask them kind of the same kind of pain questions that you would ask for any other condition. Um, when it happens, where, when it started, if it's radiating, what type of pain, how they would explain it, all that. And then really taking a whole person approach. So asking about their sleep, asking about, um, their stress levels, asking about like the supports they have, asking about how they handle stress, because all those really play a major role in your pelvic floor. Um, so someone who has a more of a stressful life, not much support, isn't getting good sleep, typically will have more um, tightness in their pelvic floor. Um, and so managing those things as best as we can or finding resources to help um, with that area will be important in providing um, support to the pelvic floor, okay? Um, so this is an interesting study I wanted to share with everyone. Um, so it was done in 2018. So before this study, there was studies that were, um, um, it would like it notice the relationship between low back pain and pelvic floor dysfunction. But prior to this study, all the studies were pretty much just self-reported. So people would have low back pain and they would say, yeah, I have urinary incontinence. Yes, I have pelvic organ prolapse. I have urgency. Um, but there was no internal vaginal exam done to confirm if there was a pelvic floor dysfunction, if they were just experiencing some symptoms. So this is the first study to my knowledge, and I'm pretty sure to the author's knowledge, that they um, took patients with low back pain and um, did an internal pelvic exam with self questionnaires to see if there was a correlation between um, clients with low back pain and pelvic floor dysfunction. So they ended up using, so these were um, pelvic health therapists were the um, examiners um, who worked in an outpatient clinic who saw a mixed caseload of um, pelvic health and like MSK population. And so they took, they asked people who came into the clinic who were coming not for pelvic health, but for just like back pain 
Um, so for not, they were not expecting an internal exam um, and asked them if they wanted to participate in this study. Okay, so they ended up excluding, obviously, people who referred, refused the internal exam, um, people who were pregnant, um, narcotic use, um, and then anything with a radiculopathy. So they only included people with um, pain just to the glutes, so anything below the glutes into the legs, they were also excluded. So it ended up with 85 people that they were able to assess with this. Um, and they ended up doing the Austri low back disability questionnaire. They did, um, they asked self-reported questions associated with pelvic floor. So they asked each person, it was like just a yes or no answer. They asked them if they experienced urinary incontinence, fecal incontinence, um, if they have chronic constipation or chronic pelvic pain, and then dyspareunia, which is like painful intercourse. And they just answered yes or no to that. Then they did their assessment. So they did um, uh, repeat uh, movement testing to see um, if they're like radiculopathy or like mechanical low back pain. Then they also did um, four tests. So they did the active straight leg raise um, test. They did the active, right, active straight leg raise test with lateral compression to see if that improved or worsened their, um, made lifting their leg more easier. Uh, then the P4, which is the posterior pelvic pain provocation test, so that's where someone's lying supine, you bend your hip up to 90 degrees, and then you provide a, like, force down the line of the femur um, and see if that reproduces their pain. And then they also use the force Faber, which is, again, where someone's lying supine, you take their leg, kind of put it in a figure four over their other knee, um, and then push down um, and see if that is a provocation of pain as well. And then lastly, they did the internal vaginal exam, and that's where they looked at um, any tenderness in the pelvic floor. They looked at the strength of the pelvic floor, and then they also looked if there was any pelvic organ prolapse. Okay, so what they ended up finding was... Um, that 95% of the women had a pelvic floor dysfunction on a digital exam. So they found that, so that's like pretty significant. So it's almost every single person that they assessed had pelvic floor findings. So that um, was a pretty significant finding out of the study. Um, they found that 70% of those women had pelvic floor tenderness um, and almost 66% had pelvic floor weakness. Okay, and then in the self-reported conditions, 83.5% had at least one or more conditions. So again, that was the urinary incontinence, the fecal incontinence, the chronic constipation, the chronic pain, um, or chronic pelvic pain, and the dyspareunia, the painful intercourse. Okay, and they found that the highest self-reported symptom was urinary incontinence, uh, followed by chronic pain and painful intercourse. Okay, so definitely like something to think about when you're seeing um, clients with pelvic floor, maybe some questions to start asking to screen them. Um, so um, through the discussion, they related, um, talked about how pelvic floor tenderness is um, linked to higher resting tone and decreased relaxation. Um, and then they found that a lot of the people presented with both tenderness and weakness. So just because a muscle is weak, it doesn't mean that um, that it just needs strengthening to happen if uh, like if you're by so they found so yeah so anyway so if your like pelvic floor was stuck like your bicep like half contracted here and it like couldn't sit at its side you would want to lengthen that bicep first relax it and then start strengthening it um and, as opposed to just strengthening it in like this small range of motion so um so they just talked about how um, careful consideration of the state of the pelvic floor is important before starting pelvic floor strengthening and associated stability protocols. Um, because I know definitely like when I was in school and when I first started practicing, anyone with low back pain pretty much needed core stability. Um, and so we just started strengthening um, the core right away. And um, with a lot of these pelvic floor clients, that's not necessarily what you want to be doing. You often want to be um, relaxing the pelvic floor, lengthening it, and then starting to strengthen it. So um, something to kind of consider when you're um, working with patients with low back, especially if you suspect that there may be a pelvic floor dysfunction, that there may already be like hypertonicity of the muscle, and you may want to look at like breath work to relax those muscles. Okay. Um, so in conclusion, they found that pelvic floor muscle dysfunction is highly correlated with lumbar pelvic pain. So 95% is a pretty high correlation. And they also question contemporary treatment approaches to lumbar pelvic pain, that they may need to be reconsidered and normalize the use of an internal exam of the pelvic floor. 
Okay, so again, like looking at the pelvic floor, looking at the whole person, I personally think that um, pelvic floor assessment should be kind of standard with these populations. Obviously, I'm a little bit biased, but um, um, I see so many people referred to me who have went through conventional physio um, and not improving, and it's because their pelvic floor um, has to be addressed. Obviously, people in clinic are getting lots of people with low back pain better, so nothing everyone needs to be. Um, <clears throat> have a pelvic floor assessment, but definitely if things are not progressing how you would expect them to, it's an area to start considering. Um, so then the limitations of the study were obviously the examiners weren't blinded and they were different examiners and so they all would have their own procedures and assess their biases, so that could definitely play a role. Okay, so I have this um, questionnaire. Um, I don't know if you guys get an email after this, but if you want to email this out, I can. Um, so these are some questions that you can kind of start thinking about with some clients that you might work with. So I know prior to doing pelvic health, I always ask, like, do you have um, lost control of bowel and bladder, right? Um, it's a red flag or screening for aquatic equina. Um, but other than that, I never went any deeper into any of those questions. Um, and most people I know who work in um, outpatient orthopedics, don't ask much more than that either. So even if you don't ask like all these questions, starting to ask like, you know, do you experience any urine loss? Because again, that was the number one self-reported symptom on that study um, with like, you know, on the way to the washroom, do you like, are you running there and have strong urgency and you like can't make it? Or do you have incontinence when you're coughing or sneezing or doing your workouts? Those could be kind of, oh, maybe there is a pelvic floor dysfunction happening if they answer yes. Um, do you feel pelvic um, pressure? So that can, or like heaviness, that can kind of indicate that there may be a prolapse happening. And then asking about painful intercourse. So you might not go into all the questions that I ask about it, but just generally is intercourse painful? Um, yes or no. Um, and again, that might lead you like, oh, maybe their pelvic floor is too tight if um, penetration is painful. Maybe the pelvic floor is not relaxing enough to allow that to happen. Um, and then there's all these conditions here. So if you know anyone has these conditions and they're coming to you with low back, they definitely should be referred to a pelvic floor therapist for sure. Um, so something to go in first. So if you want this sent, um, I don't know if there's an email that we can all send it all to you or what, um, but let me know and I'll provide that to you. Um, and then Kegels. So again, a lot of people like, oh, you have incontinence, so just start doing your Kegels. Um, so usually it's not effective. Um, and the, in 2008, the clinical guidelines on the conservative management of urinary incontinence from the Society of Obstetricians and Gynecologists of Canada recommend that in order to actually perform a Kegel exercise, you should be confirmed with a digital vaginal exam or biofeedback. So that's like just telling someone to do a Kegel and not actually um, being internally and knowing that they're doing a Kegel um, is probably not going to be effective or it could be a lot more effective if there was that direct feedback um, for them to know what they're doing. And I would just know, like, personally, um, you know, I assess four to six people a week and um, maybe one in 10 are doing a really good Kegel. A lot of them are doing like a semi-Kegel or something. Um, some aren't even contracting their pelvic floor at all. And they've been, they tell me, oh, I've been doing Kegels for years. They don't work. Well, obviously they're not working. You're not even doing it right. Um, so, um, but they don't even, they don't know that, right? People don't know. And so it's really with an internal exam. So if you do suspect people are having a pelvic floor issue, don't just like prescribe them Kegels. Um, if anything, it's probably just not going to change much. Okay. Um, so how you can kind of start helping these people um, who you suspect may have a pelvic floor dysfunction is to just really focus on reducing tension. And the best way to do that is through breath. Okay, so like even in the study and what I find clinically say that like most of these women have pelvic floor tenderness. Um, so tension, so the pelvic floor is not sitting at resting length, it has increased tone. So teaching them how to breathe um, and like do diaphragmatic breathing or umbrella breathing um, can be really powerful and probably one of the best exercises to start these clients with. Um, 
So really focus on, um, you know, as you inhale, that diaphragm is going to descend, your stomach's going to rise, your pelvic floor will lengthen. Um, and then as you exhale, everything returns. So kind of really giving them cues, making sure their chest isn't moving as they're taking that breath in, that their stomach's expanding. And even I give the cue of like, as you take an inhale, as you breathe in, imagine your vulva as a flower. And as you inhale, that's flowers like opening. Um, so that would be a great exercise to start someone off with if you feel that they might have a pelvic floor dysfunction. And even if you're going to start getting into core stability, this is a great way to just kind of connect that whole canister together as well. Okay. Um, and then some basic exercises that are great for low back, pelvic floor, um, pain and tension are, um, child's pose, cat, cow, pigeon, happy baby, um, depending on the population you're working with, they might have to be um, modified a little bit, like maybe they're not able to do a pigeon, they have to do like a figure four stretch on their back, um, or maybe they need a pillow for child's pose, like modifications can be given, um, but these are great ways to start lengthening the low back and pelvic floor together, and I encourage people like while they're doing these stretches to um, like use that diaphragmatic breath like so try to be breathing all the way down into your stomach all the way down into your pelvic floor while you're working through these movements okay so that's kind of an overview and um if you have any questions let me know um so i do have a couple case studies um that i wanted to just share some different clients that i work with to give you an understanding of um of the different type of clients that I see. Okay, so these are current clients that I'm seeing. Most of them are not regular clients anymore. Um, they come kind of every couple months or so as a bit of a maintenance or checkup, but um, um, they're all real clients. I have talked to them. They've all given me permission to share their stories. Um, I have changed their names just to not identify them, but um, they have all given me permission. So this here is Sarah. She's a 43-year-old um, female who came into my office, presented with low back pain. She explained it to be a stabbing pain um, that felt like a knife was twisting into her back and intermittently would experience numbness down the posterior right leg until the knee. Nothing went past her knee. Um, she said the pain began when she was pregnant with her first child. And at first, she actually didn't know when her pain began. So it wasn't until I started asking about her pregnancies and about different things did she say, you know what, actually that did start when I was pregnant. Um, her children are now nine and five. Okay, so when we talked about her births, she said she had two vaginal deliveries. They were Her description is that they were long, intense, and traumatic. After her first, she was barely able to walk for six months. And after her second, um, it took four months before she was able to walk. So she definitely um, didn't want to talk about the details with me. It was a really traumatic experience, but caused significant trauma to her pelvis. So um, she found that pain was limiting her ability to be active with her children, bending down, lifting, laundry, working out, all significantly increased her pain. Um, and so it was starting to affect the things that she enjoyed doing. Okay, um, and she worked as, um, did desk work for the government. Okay, so when I started asking her about um, her bladder, she did note that she had um, stress urinary incontinence with coughing and sneezing, and that she did have a bit of an overactive bladder, so she would void 10 to 15 times a day. Um, normal is five to eight times a day with none overnight for her age population. At first, she told me she had no issues with her bowels, but then again, as we started talking more, she said, well, actually, in December, she went to the eMERGE for pain and constipation. It had been like almost a week before she had a bowel movement, um, and she normally doesn't feel done, and bowel movements are usually every three to four days. So I wouldn't call that no issues with her bowel movements. I would definitely think there is. So again, people often like, oh, I'm fine, I'm fine, and then as you dive deeper, they start to um, kind of share more with you. Okay, intercourse was fine. She had no issues with that. And then in the past, she's seen, um, I think she's seen like two or three physios and then two chiros um, with not much change in her symptoms, maybe a day or two relief, um, but then it would completely return. Um, it wasn't until her last physio that they recommended that she see a pelvic floor therapist. So I'm not sure if they asked her more questions and then thought it was appropriate or if they had just thought, I don't know what's going on, try pelvic floor. Because um, I do get a lot of patients like that, that um, conventional physio wasn't working and they refer to pelvic floor a lot. Um, so in my assessment with her, I found that she had full hip and lumbar mobility. There was no reproduce, reproduction of pain. Um, her straight leg raise on the left was 100 degrees and right was 90. So 
pretty normal, um, her fader. Um, she had impingement on the right and it was normal on the left. And then um, her Faber reproduced significant adductor pain. It wasn't the exact thing that she's experiencing, but it was an uncomfortable, her neurological testing was normal. So when I did the internal vaginal exam, I found that there was a grade one anterior bulge. So that means like a small prolapse of her bladder. She had no issues of the second or third layer, of the first or second layer, but then in the third deeper layer that I had shown you, she had tenderness on, patient, on palpation bilaterally of the iliococcygeus and obturated and turnerous muscle, and it was significantly more on the right than the left, um, and it was a reproduction of her right hip pain. Um, so... Sarah, I ended up seeing, um, I saw her a couple times, like once a week for a couple weeks. Um, we kind of got her pain down under control with a lot of release and stretching of the obturator internus specifically, relaxation of the pelvic floor. And then um, within a couple of weeks, we started to reduce the frequency um, and she would come up, come back in for more like just soft tissue release. Um, so currently we're down to every two months. She finds if she goes more than two months, her pain does start to come back and she's not comfortable with that. There are more things that she could do at home, but she lives a really stressful life and she just really would rather just come in, get a release and not be bothered to do um, some of the things I recommended. And that's fine. I know it's a lot of work. So um, once every two months, I would say it's not bad for someone who's had um, like nine years of low back pain. Um, so another client I see, um, we'll call her Emma. Um, so she's a little bit different person than people generally think that come to pelvic floor. So she's a 22 year old female presenting with pain with intercourse. That was the initial complaint that she came with. Um, um, intercourse has always been painful. The first time she inserted a tampon at 14, it was incredibly painful. She was unsuccessful. Um, and then now any kind of penetration, deeper penetration around the vaginal opening anywhere is incredibly painful and usually unsuccessful. Um, as we started talking, she also has um, had low back pain for years, no mechanism of injury that she can think of. She has a stress incontinence, so with uh, working out specifically with running and jumping, so that actually is limiting what she does in the gym. Um, she loves, she would love to be doing running and skipping. Her partner does a lot of that, and she's finding it difficult to participate. Um, her bowels are normal, um, and then she was a physio who has now returned to school for further training. Okay. Um, so I never did a full low back pain assessment on her um, because her initial complaint wasn't low back. Her real focus was the painful penetration. Um, so that's really what we focused on. Um, so we taught, found that she had like a significantly hypertonic pelvic floor and allodynia. So um, just gentle pressure was incredibly painful and sensitive for her. Um, so with her, we primarily focused on relaxation and downregulating her central nervous system because everything was very um, upregulated. Um, so we did that with reconnecting to her deep core system through a lot, a lot of breath work and um, some stress management strategies. Um, we also ended up using dilators, which are something that I use for people with painful penetration, especially to the degree that Emma was experiencing. Um, so I'm not gonna go too much into that. If you have questions, you can ask, um, but that is something that we can use uh, for this client. Um, and then once her symptoms, she started to achieve painful, um, pain-free penetration, um, she was able to successfully be intimate with her partner again without issues. This took us about like eight months. So it's not a super fix, um, like quick fix. And this is something that she'll likely have to maintain for the rest of her life. Um, now that she has to come to pelvic health physio, but she'll have to like definitely be doing stretching and stuff that I had given her. Um, we were then able to start adding some functional movements. I never ended up doing any goals with her. We just started changing how she was working out and positional um, positions, like how she was running and jumping and how she was lifting um, to allow her to no longer have incontinence with doing these activities. Because I thought Kegels would just um, increase her pelvic floor tension again. Okay, and then the next person, a little bit different, is Ava. So she's a little bit older. She came into my office. She was a 72-year-old female presenting with a feeling that something was inside her. She explained it as like a heaviness or pressure. This started in January 20, um, uh, 2022. She saw her doctor. He told her that she had a prolapse, was referred to an OBGYN who fitted her for a pessary and said she go to pelvic floor physio. So um, um, a prolapse is um, like 
for her, it was her bladder. So her bladder had kind of fallen a little bit into the vaginal opening and that was the bulge and the pressure that she was experiencing. And then the pessary is this like silicone circle device for the most part that gets inserted vaginally to help support the, um, the bladder. Okay. Um, but she was actually fortunate enough that he fitted it for her and taught her how to put it in, her, in and out of herself. So she was able to use it when she needed it and not have it in all times, which is pretty rare, especially up here in Sudbury, I find. Um, so her history, she had one vaginal birth uh, 49 years ago. Her explanation, it was long and challenging birth lasting a couple of days. She couldn't remember specifics about it. She couldn't remember like how long she was pushing for or anything like that, but definitely more traumatic deliveries, um, longer pushing times can lead to prolapse. And after someone goes through menopause, um, the decrease in estrogen can cause atrophy to the tissues and it can um, present prolapse symptoms that were, maybe weren't there before. Um, she reported some urinary incontinence with coughing and sneezing. She reported always wearing a liner just in case. Um, and then the other thing that was neat to note that I thought would be cool to share with you guys, in 2018, she was diagnosed with bronolectasis um, and prescribed an oscillating posit positive expiratory pressure device that required huffing and coughing after each use four times a day. So I think, and so did the OBGYN, that likely the repetitiveness of this huffing and coughing um, every day for the last uh, four years probably provoked her pro pelvic floor um, or her prolapse symptoms. Um, and just to give you an idea, like she was a retired teacher, very type A personality. When she came back after her first um, session with me, she um, um, like had a whole tally and was like, oh, I'm sorry, I missed this one day and everything else was like checked off. She did exactly what I said to a T. So this is someone who is truly doing her exercises four times a day. Um, so with her, what we did, uh, well, sorry, with this internal assessment, I found that with the coxie, yes, she did have a grade two interior bulge, so a bladder prolapse. Um, there was no issues with her pelvic floor. So this was rare. Like normally, like I said, there's always tenderness in someone's pelvic floor. Um, Ava did not have that. It was truly a strength issue that we needed to focus on with her. Um, so like regular muscle testing, she was about a three plus. Um, for her strength, so just a bit about gravity, she was able to hold her Kegel for three seconds, and I only challenged that for one rep. That's what the three plus three one means. Um, so for her, what we did for treatment was we taught her reconnecting her pelvic floor. So even though she didn't need breath training, I still did that with her to just understand how the pelvic floor worked with her breath. We then added Kegels with her breath. Um, and that's really all we did for strengthening. The big change for her was education on the positions. So, you know, I can't just tell her, well, stop doing these exercises. They're causing your prolapse because, well, they're meant to like take phlegm out of her system. So she's not going to get infections again or pneumonia or something. So they're important. So she can't stop doing these. So instead I educated on the, her position when doing these breathing exercises. So, um, you know, as opposed to just telling her to do like these huffing and um, like active cycle of breathing or whatever she was told exactly. Um, we got her to be sitting on the corner of a chair um, with her perineum, like in kind of more um, her pelvis in an anterior tilt with her perineum pressure right on the um, corner of the chair. And then when we did the exercises, she no longer felt that like heaviness or that bulge happening at her pelvic floor. So, you know, especially if you're a hospital physio and you're teaching people like active cycle of breathing, um, maybe think about the position that they're in. Cause when you're in that anterior tilt, it gives your pelvic floor and your core, um, more chances to work. It just puts it at a mechanical advantage. So I thought it would be interesting to share um, if you are teaching people that and you know they're like in menopause or after menopause and they've had babies, like just doing that simple interior tilt on a corner of a chair um, can make a world of a difference. Um, so I now just see her once every three or four months um, just to review what she's doing because the prolapse isn't going to go away for her. Um, but we are managing it super well and she's barely needing to use her pessary now. Um, so I wanted to share that story with you. Um, so these are the resources and that's the end. Does anyone have any questions for me? Thank you, Ashley. Again, if you're comfortable, please take yourself off of mute. I'll put the questions in the chat. In terms of what additional kind of postgraduate training you did, right, to, to get into this. Sorry, stuff. I can't hear you super well. 
Sorry, I was just asking what postgraduate training you did uh, for. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, so I did my courses through Pelvic Health Solutions. They're a company out in Vaughan. Um, and so I've done their level one pelvic floor uh, course, which is primarily focused on urinary incontinence for men and women. I then did my level two and three, which is um, more complex conditions like endometriosis, infectious cystitis, um, lichens. There's a whole bunch of conditions um, that that goes through. Um, then it went into level three, which is more um, taking like a biopsychosocial approach to pain and pelvic health. Um, so not just being super mechanical, but really, again, diving into that whole person approach. Um, and then I did a pregnancy and um, postpartum course with them. And then I did a visceral course as well, which kind of talked about some mobilizations of the visceral system. So all of it was through Pelvic Health Solutions. Um, they're just super accessible and bond and they have a lot of online courses. Um, there are other companies out there through the states and stuff and with virtual now kind of made things more accessible. Um, but to be honest, you can just do um, pelvic floor physio with one weekend course after your level one. So not everyone needs to have all the training to be rostered to do a pelvic exam. Does it answer you? Oh, oh no, that's great. Yeah, I was just curious what uh, all training you had done and, and you, you answered that in terms of uh, what training is required in order to, to do this. And I'm, I'm assuming maybe on the, the physio college database that there there's maybe a listing of people who have, who are rostered for, for pelvic health physio. I don't know if on the college, I don't believe so. I could be wrong on that, but I don't believe so. Um, through Pelvic Health Solutions, they do have a list of um, people who have went through their course. Um, however, you have to pay for that to be listed. And uh, so not everyone who's went through the course is listed because they might not. I think it's like a $250 membership a year. So if they chose not to pay that, um, they won't show up on that. So um it is kind of tricky to find. Um, you kind of just need to like see who's providing the services and then um, look into their bio really um, to see who does that. Or you would look up each person individually and then it would say like that I am rostered for this, but there's not a super accessible site to know if someone's doing an internal exam. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. so that, uh, with people on the call across Northern Ontario. I wasn't sure if there was a, an easy way for someone to find a, a pelvic floor physio to be able to refer to in their area. Yeah, it would just be through Google and then um, and then find out if they are doing. Usually in their bio, they'll say like they're due internal exams, um, but it would just be through Google your area mostly. Thank you. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, there, and there are large wait times. I know I'm here in Thunder Bay and we have very few physiotherapists that do pelvic health. And I know the wait times. I remember with my last child, I tried to get in and it was impossible. So it took me, I think, six months after post labor to get in. So it would be nice to have a database just so. Yeah, there, there is kind of one, um, but again, it's not all inclusive. Um, yeah, mine, I'm about two months. I'm mid-December. I'm booking into right now. Um, there are more physios that are popping up who are doing this. Um, it's definitely become a hot topic. So it is definitely becoming coming more common. Thunder Bay's hard because of the location and stuff for people to do the training probably. But um, yeah, it's getting there. I have to say that at least. Is there any other questions for Ashley? I know sometimes this can be a sensitive topic, so if you're not comfortable speaking up or putting it in the chat, do email me. I can link you with Ashley, um, but I'll open it up again for any questions. Yeah, I'd be happy to receive any questions you have through email. I can answer them that way as well. And I will also email everyone the checklist um, once they receive it from Ashley that's in attendance today. other questions. So Ashley, I just want to say thank you. It was a wonderful topic. Um, I know it can be sensitive to some, so thank you. Um, I learned a lot 
and um, I hope everyone has a wonderful afternoon. Great. Thank you so much for having me.